Marcos from Barcelona, but he could be anyone, anywhere. What is about to happen to him occurs daily in offices and homes all over the world. A part inside the printer has failed, and the manufacturer sends Marcos to technical support. El meu tècnic fa un diagnòstic, un diagnòstic previ, però aquest diagnòstic ja són 15 euros més IVA. Segurament serà difícil encontrar les peces per poder reparar-la. Realment, reparar-la no li surt molt a compte. Que reparar-la parlem d'un 100 d'euros, 120 euros. Tienes impressores des de 39 euros. Jo t'aconsellaria que miressis impressores noves. Així que sens dubte jo em compraria una nova, eh? It's no coincidence that all three shopkeepers suggest buying a new printer. If he agrees, Marcos will become yet another victim of planned obsolescence, the secret mechanism at the heart of our consumer society. Our role in life seems to be just to consume things with credit, to borrow money to buy things we don't need. Nous vivons dans une société dominée par une économie de croissance dont la logique est non pas croître pour satisfaire les besoins, mais croître pour croître. So if the consumer does not purchase, you know, the economy is not going to grow. Planned obsolescence. The desire on the part of a consumer to own something a little newer, a little sooner than is necessary. This film will reveal how planned obsolescence has defined our lives ever since the 1920s, when manufacturers started shortening the lives of products to increase consumer demand. Also hat man sich gedacht, dann beschränken wir einfach die Lebensdauer auf 1000 Stunden. We will find out how designers and engineers were made to adopt new values and objectives was back to the drawing board and come out with something that was more fragile. They time those things. They time them. So when you finally pay for them, they're used up. A new generation of consumers has started challenging manufacturers. Is it possible to imagine a viable economy without planned obsolescence, without its impact on the environment? Posterity will never forgive us. Posterity will suddenly find out about the throwaway lifestyles of people in the advanced countries. Welcome to Livermore, California, home of the longest burning light bulb in the world. My name's Lynn Owens. And I am chairman of the light bulb committee. It was in 1972 when we discovered that the light bulb that was hanging in the fire station was a significant light bulb. The light bulb at the Livermore fire station has been burning continuously since 1901. Ironically, the bulb has already outlasted two webcams. In 2001, when the bulb was 100 years old, the people of Livermore threw a big birthday party, American style. I think we were hoping if we would get 200 people, we'd be happy. And we ended up with eight or 900 people showing up. Do you think that anybody would sing happy birthday to a light bulb? Well, we didn't think they would, but they did. <laughs> the origin of the bulb was it was produced in a town called Shelby, Ohio, back around 1895 and put together by some 
very interesting ladies that I have some pictures of and some gentlemen that, that invested in the company. The filament was invented by Adolphe Chalet. He invented his filament to last. Why does his filament last? I don't know. It's a secret that he made and that died with him. Chalet's formula for a long-lasting filament is not the only mystery in the history of the light bulb. A much bigger secret is how the humble light bulb became the first victim of planned obsolescence. Weihnachten 1924 war ein ganz besonderer Tag. In einem Hinterzimmer in Genf trafen sich einige Herren in Nadelstreifenanzügen, um einem geheimen Plan nachzugehen. Sie gründeten das erste weltweite Kartell, das sich zum Ziel setzte, die Glühbirnenproduktion der gesamten Länder zu kontrollieren und den Kuchen namens Weltmarkt unter sich aufzuteilen. Dieses Kartell hat den Namen Phoebus. Phoebus included the main light bulb manufacturers in Europe and the United States and even faraway colonies in Asia and Africa. Das Ziel ist gewesen, Patente auszutauschen, die Produktion zu kontrollieren und vor allem aber den Verbraucher zu kontrollieren. Es ist umso besser für diese Firmen, wenn der Verbraucher regelmäßig Glühlampen kauft und wenn die Glühlampen lange brennen, ist das ein ökonomischer Nachteil. Initially, manufacturers strived for a long lifespan for their bulbs. On October 21st, 1871, numerous experiments resulted in the production of a small unit mass of comparatively enormous resistance. The filament being under conditions of great stability. Thomas Edison's first commercial bulb, on sale by 1881, lasted 1,500 hours. By 1924, when the Phoebus cartel was founded, manufacturers proudly advertised lifespans of up to 2,500 hours and stressed the longevity of their bulbs. Also hat man sich bei Phoebus gedacht, ähm, dann beschränken wir einfach die Lebensdauer dieser einzelnen Glühbirnen auf 1000 Stunden. 1925 wird ein entsprechendes Komitee gegründet, das 1000 Hour Life Committee, was sich zum Ziel setzt, auf technischer Basis die Lebensdauer der Glühlampen auf diese Brenndauer zu beschränken. More than 80 years later, Helmut Hüge, an historian from Berlin, uncovers proof of the committee's activities hidden in the internal documents of the founding members of the cartel, such as Philips in Holland. Osram in Germany and Compagnie de Lomme in France. Here we have a cartel document that states the average life of lamps for general lighting service must not be guaranteed, published or offered for another value than 1,000 hours. Under pressure from the cartel, member companies conducted experiments to create a more fragile bulb that would conform with the new 1,000-hour rule. Bulb production was monitored rigorously to make sure cartel members complied. Eine Maßnahme bestand beispielsweise darin, einen Prüfstand zu errichten, in dem viele kleine Sockel zu finden sind, in die dann wiederum einzelne Exemplare aus verschiedenen Produktionsreihen eingeschraubt wurden und Firmen wie Osram haben dann genauestens protokolliert, wie lange diese Lampen brannten. Phoebus enforced its rules through an elaborate bureaucracy. Members were fined heavily if their monthly life reports were off the mark. Hier haben wir eine Straftabelle aus dem Jahr 1929, die genau zeigt, wie viel Schweizer Franken Strafe für 1000 verkaufte Glühbirnen die Mitglieder des Kartells zahlen müssen, wenn die Lampen länger halten als zum Beispiel 1500 Stunden. As planned obsolescence took effect, 
lifespans fell steadily. In just two years, they dropped from 2,500 hours to less than 1,500 hours. By the 1940s, the cartel had reached its goal. 1,000 hours had become the standard lifespan for bulbs. I can see how this was very tempting in 1932. I think at the time, sustainability was actually substantially less of an issue because I don't think they looked at the planet as being one with finite uh, amount of resources. They looked at it as from an abundance perspective. Ironically, the light bulb has always been a symbol for ideas and innovation, and yet it's one of the early and best examples of planned obsolescence. In the following decades, inventors filed dozens of patents for new light bulbs, including one lasting 100,000 hours. None of them reached the general market. Offiziell hat es ja Phobos eigentlich nie gegeben, wenn auch diese Spuren der Öffentlichkeit nie ganz verborgen gewesen sind. Die Strategie dahinter ist, sich in bestimmten Zeitabständen immer wieder umzubenennen. Dann heißt es mal internationales Elektrizitätskartell, dann mal wieder irgendein anderer Name. Ähm, entscheidend ist, dass diese Idee als Institution natürlich weiter besteht. In Barcelona, Marcos hasn't followed the advice of the shopkeepers to replace his printer. He's determined to repair it and has found somebody on the internet who has discovered what has actually happened to his printer. It's the dirty little secret of inkjet printers. I tried to print a document and it said parts inside your printer require replacement. So I decided to do a little servicing of my own. Hello, Marcos. I got your message. Marcos has contacted the author of the video. How are you? I looked into it and it, it turns out that there's a, there's a thing in the bottom of the printer called a waste ink reservoir. Um, and the way inkjet printers work is they constantly have to clean the, the print heads and they do that by squirting ink through them down a hole in the bottom of the printer into this great big sponge. There's just a, a, a preset time when it's squirted a certain number of drops down there that then the printer decides it's full of ink and, and won't function anymore. Mm -hmm. The justification is they don't want us to put ink all over your desk. But I, I think the problem goes deeper than that. It's the, the, the way the technology works. It's just designed to fail. Planned obsolescence emerged at the same time as mass production and the consumer society. The whole issue with products being made to last less long is part of a whole pattern that began in the Industrial Revolution when the new machines were producing goods so much more cheaply, which was a great thing for consumers, but consumers couldn't keep up with the machines. There was so much production. As early as 1928, an influential advertising magazine warns that an article that refuses to wear out is a tragedy of business. In fact, mass production made many goods widely available. Prices fell and many people started shopping for fun rather than need. The economy was booming. consumer society came to a full stop when the Wall Street crash sent the U.S. into a deep economic recession. Unemployment reached staggering proportions. By 1933, one-fourth of our labor force was unemployed. People no longer queued for goods, but for work and for food. From New York came a radical proposal on how to kickstart the economy again. Bernard London, a prominent real estate broker, suggested ending the depression by making planned obsolescence compulsory by law. It was the first time the concept was put into writing. Under Bernard London's proposal, 
all products would be given a lease of life with a set expiry date, after which they would be considered legally dead. Consumers would turn them over to a government agency where they would be destroyed. He was trying to achieve a balance between capital and labor where there would always be a market for new goods. So there would always be a need for labor and there would always be a reward for capital. Bernard London believed that with compulsory planned obsolescence, the wheels of industry would keep turning, people would keep consuming, and everyone would have a job. Giles Slade has come to New York to investigate the person behind the idea. He wants to find out if for Bernard London, planned obsolescence was purely about profits or about helping the unemployed. I have a picture of Bernard London. Dorothea Weitzner remembers meeting Bernard London in the 1930s during a family outing. Don't tell me which one okay. he is. Okay. Let's see. Ah, oh, isn't that interesting? Yes. Definitely intellectual looking. And you met Bernard London in uh, 1933. When I was about 16, 17, my dad and mother had this big Cadillac car, which was the size of a Zeppelin. Mother was driving like a chauffeur. Dad was in the front, and Mr. and Mrs. London were in the back of the big limousine. Dad said that Mr. London should explain his philosophy to me. He's a very interesting man. And he just told me in a few words that that was his idea to reduce the depression. We were in an economic mess, worse than today even. He was obsessed with this idea. Like an artist is uh, utterly obsessed with his paintings, you know. He actually whispered to me in the car, afraid that his theory might be um, too radical. In fact, Bernard London's proposal was ignored and obsolescence by legal obligation was never put into practice. Twenty years later, in the 1950s, the idea resurfaced, but with a crucial twist. Instead of forcing planned obsolescence on the consumers, they were to be seduced by it. Planned obsolescence. The desire on the part of a consumer to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. We certainly in America... This is the voice now, of Brooks Stevens, the apostle of planned obsolescence in post-war America. This flamboyant industrial designer created everything from household appliances to cars and trains, always with planned obsolescence in mind. In the spirit of the times, Brooks Stevens' designs conveyed speed and modernity. Even the house he lived in was unusual. This is the home that my father designed and that I grew up in. When it was being built out in the suburbs, everybody thought it was going to be the new Greyhound bus station because it did not look like a traditional home. One of the most important things that my father felt always in designing a product is that it made a statement. He detested products that were bland and really uh, did not you know, create any desire uh, within the consumer to inspire the purchase. Unlike the European approach of the past where they tried to make the very best product and make it last forever, meaning you bought such a fine suit of clothes that you were married in it and then buried in it and never a chance to renew it, the approach in America is one of making the American consumer unhappy with the product that he has enjoyed the use of for a period, have him pass it on to the second-hand market and obtain the newest product with the newest possible look. Brooks Stevens traveled all over the U.S. to promote planned obsolescence in speech after speech. His approach became the gospel of the time. Women and men alike are increasingly interested in the look of things. They eagerly give their attention to what's new and beautiful and advanced. Design and marketing seduced consumers into always craving the latest model. My father never designed a product to intentionally fail 
or become obsolete for some functional reason in a short period of time. Planned obsolescence is, is absolutely at the consumer's discretion. Uh, no one is forcing the consumer to go into the store uh, and purchase a product. Uh, you know, they go in under their own free will. That's their choice. Freedom and happiness through unlimited consumption. The American way of life in the 1950s became the foundation for the consumer society as we know it today. See, without planned obsolescence, these places wouldn't exist. There wouldn't be any products, there wouldn't be any industry, there wouldn't be any designers, architects, there wouldn't be any salespeople, cleaners, there wouldn't be any security guards. All the jobs would go. So how often do you change your mobiles? 18 months. Once a year. Once a year. Once a year. Once a year. These days, planned obsolescence is an integral part of the curriculum at design and engineering schools. Boris Knuth lectures on the concept of product life cycle, a modern euphemism for planned obsolescence. I went shopping for you. I've got a couple of things. A pan, salt, shirt, another shirt. Students are taught how to design for a business world dominated by one single goal, frequent repeat purchase. What I do, I pass these round, and you tell me what you think, how long it takes for them to fail, what the service life will be. Okay. Designers have to understand what company they work for. If the company decides on a business model, how often do we want to renew our products, our offers? So this brief is given to designers, and designers have to understand and design the product in a certain way so it fits exactly the... Uh, the business strategy of the, of the client they work for. Planned obsolescence is at the root of the substantial economic growth that the Western world has experienced since the 1950s. Ever since, growth has been the holy grail of our economy. Nous vivons dans une société de croissance dont la logique est Non pas croître pour satisfaire les besoins, mais croître pour croître, croître à l'infini, faire croître sans limite la production et pour justifier cette croissance de la production, faire croître sans limite la consommation. Serge Latouche is a noted critic of the Growth Society and has written extensively about its mechanisms. Au fond, il y a trois instruments fondamentaux qui sont la publicité, l'obsolescence programmée et le crédit. In the last generation or so, our role in life seems to be just to consume things with credit, to borrow money, to buy things we don't need. That makes no real sense to me at all. Critics of the Growth Society point out that it's unsustainable in the long run because it's based on a flagrant contradiction. Celui qui croit qu'une croissance infinie est compatible avec une planète finie est soit un fou, soit un économiste. Le drame, c'est qu'au fond, nous sommes tous des économistes maintenant. Why is it that a new product is created every three minutes somewhere in the world? Is this necessary? I think a lot of people have realized that things need to change when they're being told by politicians to go shopping or to start consuming as the best way to restart the economy. On peut dire qu'avec la société de croissance, on est en, embarqué dans un bolide qui désormais manifestement n'a plus de pilote, qui va à toute allure et qui, dont on peut prévoir le destin qui est soit de se fracasser contre un mur, soit de sombrer dans un précipice. Looking at the service manuals of different printers, 
Marcos realizes that the lifespan of many printers is set by the engineers right from the start. They achieve this by placing a chip deep inside the printer. How do engineers feel about designing products to fail? The dilemma is captured in a British film from 1951 where a young chemist invents an everlasting thread. He believes that great progress has been made. But not everyone is happy with his discovery. And soon he finds himself on the run, not only from the factory owners, but also from the workers, all fearing for their jobs. Well, that's really interesting. And it reminds me of something that actually happened in the textile industry. In 1940, the chemical giant DuPont announced the arrival of a revolutionary synthetic fiber, nylon. Girls celebrated the new long-lasting stockings, but the joy was short-lived. My father worked for DuPont before and after the war in the nylon division. And he told me a story about how when nylon first came out and they were trying it out for use in stockings, the men in his division were asked to take these stockings home for their wives and girlfriends to try out. My father brought them home to my mother and she was delighted with the first products because they were so sturdy. The DuPont chemists had every reason to be proud of their achievement, as even men touted the strength of nylon stockings. The problem was, they lasted too long. The women were very happy with the fact that they didn't get runners in them. Unfortunately, this meant that the companies producing the stockings were not going to sell very many. DuPont gave new instructions to Nichols Fox's father and his colleagues. The men in his division was back to the drawing board to try to make the fibers weaker and come out with something that was more fragile and would run so that the stockings wouldn't last as long. The same chemists who'd applied their skills to make durable nylons went with the spirit of the times and made them more fragile. The everlasting thread disappeared from the factory floor, just like in the cinema. We need control of this discovery. Complete control. If you want twice the amount in that contract, we will pay it. A quarter of a million. To suppress it. Yes. How did the chemists at DuPont feel about deliberately reducing the life of a product? Excuse me. Must have been frustrating for the engineers to have to use their skills to make an inferior product after they'd tried so hard to make a good product. But, um... In a way, I suppose, that's the outsider's view. Probably they just had a job to do. Make it strong, make it weak. That was their job. Engineers were in a really complicated ethical time. This confrontation with planned obsolescence provoked them to examine their most basic ethical concepts. There was an old school of engineers who believed that they should make a permanent, usable product that would never break. And there was a new school of engineers that were driven by the market who were clearly interested in making the most uh, disposable product that they could. And um, uh, this debate resolved itself uh, by these uh, uh, new school of engineers taking over. Planned obsolescence did not only affect engineers, the frustration of ordinary consumers is echoed in Arthur Miller's classic play, Death of a Salesman. 
Just like Willie Lomax, all consumers could do was complain powerlessly. Once in my life, I'd like to own something outright before it's broken. I'm always in a race with the junkyard. Just finished paying for the car, and it's on its last legs. The treasure consumes belts like a crazy maniac. They time those things. They time them, so when you finally paid for them, they're used up. Little do consumers know that on the other side of the Iron Curtain, in the countries of the Eastern Bloc, there was a whole economy without planned obsolescence. The communist economy was not ruled by the free market, but centrally planned by the state. It was inefficient and plagued by a chronic shortage of resources. In such a system, planned obsolescence did not make any sense. In former East Germany, the most efficient communist economy, official regulations stipulated that fridges and washing machines should work for 25 years. Here, this DDR-Kühlschrank, I bought it in 1985. Der ist also mindestens 24 Jahre alt und äh, die Glühbirne ist ebenso alt, habe ich noch nie ausgewechselt, die ist also auch schon fast 25 Jahre alt. In 1981, a lighting factory in East Berlin launched a long life bulb. They took it to an international lighting fair, looking for buyers from the West. Als die ostdeutschen Glühlampenhersteller 1981 diese Langlebensdauerglühlampen auf der Hannoveraner Messe präsentierten, meinten ihre Westkollegen, ihr wollt euch wohl alle arbeitslos machen. Woraufhin die NAVA-Leute, Ingenieure antworteten, nein, im Gegenteil, indem wir Ressourcen schonen und den Wolfram nicht verpulvern, behalten wir gerade unsere Arbeitsplätze. The Western buyers rejected the bulb. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. The factory was closed, and the East German long life bulb went out of production. Now, it can only be found in exhibitions and museums. Twenty years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, consumerism is as rampant in the East as it is in the West. But there is one difference. In the age of the Internet, consumers are ready to fight against planned obsolescence. The first movie we made that really broke through was a movie about the iPod. And I was completely broke. And I had gotten this iPod, it was like 500 bucks, 400 bucks. And uh, about eight months later, 12 months later maybe, the battery died in it. And uh, I called Apple to ask them to replace the battery. And their policy at the time was to tell their customers to buy a new iPod. You might as well go get a new one. Um, Apple doesn't offer? No. Apple doesn't offer a, a new battery for the iPod? It wasn't that the battery died that was annoying, because in my Nokia cell phone, the battery dies, you buy a new battery. Even in my Apple laptop, when the battery would die, you replace the battery. Um, but in the iPod, this expensive piece of hardware, when the battery died, you had to replace the entire unit. So it was my brother's idea to make a movie about just that. We went around with a stencil spray painting on every iPod advertisement we saw in town. iPod's unreplaceable battery lasts only 18 months. We put the video on our own little site, iPodsDirtySecret.com. In the first month, six weeks, it was at five, six million views. And the site went absolutely bananas. A lawyer in San Francisco, Elizabeth Pritzker, heard about the video and together with her associates, decided to sue Apple over the lifespan of the iPod battery. Half a century after the light bulb case, planned obsolescence was in court again.
When we brought this litigation, this was two years after the iPod was introduced, uh, Apple had sold about three million iPods uh, nationwide in the United States. Many of the three million iPod owners were having battery problems and were willing to sue. One of them was Andrew Wesley. We selected from amongst the consumers who had called us individuals who would serve as representatives in a class action. A class action is really a device that's fairly unique to the United States where a small group of people stands in the shoes of a large group to bring one claim before a court. My role in that case was as class representative on behalf of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people. The case came to be known as Wesley versus Apple. When my friends and family learned that this was a major case, they thought I was, you know, becoming a radical. You know, here I am going to sue, you know, I was the next Aaron Brockovich. In December 2003, Elizabeth Pritzker filed the case at the San Mateo County Court, just a few blocks from the Apple headquarters. We asked Apple for a number of technical documents regarding the battery life in the iPod, and we received a lot of technical data about the battery design, about the testing of the battery, and learned through that discovery that the type of the lithium battery that was contained within this iPod was designed by design to really only have a short period of life. I do think that Apple's development of the iPod was intended to be uh, one of planned obsolescence. After a tense few months, both parties hammered out a settlement. Apple set up a replacement service for the batteries and extended the warranty to two years. The claimants were offered compensation. One thing that really bothers me personally is that uh, Apple really promotes itself as a young, hip, uh, forward-thinking company. And for a company like that not to have a good environmental policy that allows consumers to return products for proper recycling and disposal uh, really uh, is really counterintuitive and counter to their message. Planned obsolescence produces a constant stream of waste which is shipped to third world countries such as Ghana in Africa. It's been between eight and nine years now when I noticed that loads and loads of containers were coming to this country with electronic waste. We're talking about uh, end-of-life computers, end-of-life television sets, uh, which nobody wants in the developed countries. Shipping electronic waste to third world countries is forbidden by international law. But the merchants use a simple trick. They declare the waste as second-hand goods. More than 80% of the electronic waste that arrives in Ghana is totally beyond repair, and whole container loads are abandoned at dump sites all around the country. We are at the dump site here in Agogoshi. In the past, we have this beautiful river called the Odor River, you know, that meandered its way through um, this area. It was teeming in the past. It had so much fish. So we actually attended a school not very far away from here. So we'd come play football and hang around the river. The fishermen would organize boat rides, I remember very well. But now it's all finished, it's all gone. And that makes me really, really sad. And it makes me angry. These days, there are no school kids playing here after class. Instead, youngsters from poor families come here looking for scrap metal. They burn the plastic-covered cables from the discarded computers to salvage the metal inside. What is left is picked through by the younger children who are looking for any tiny pieces of metal which the older boys may have missed.
some of those behind the shipment have said that, well, we're trying to bridge the digital divide between Europe, America, and then the rest of Africa and Ghana, of course. But the reality is that these computers that are sent here simply do not work. There's no point in receiving um, electronic waste when you cannot deal with it, more so when you did not produce it and your country is being used as the world's trash bin. The trash that for so long in an industrial age has been hidden from view is now coming into our lives and we can actually no longer easily avoid it. The waste economy is, is reaching its uh, last legs because they don't physically have anywhere else to put the waste. I think in the course of time we've come to realize that the planet that we're living on cannot sustain that forever. There's a limit to natural resources and there's a limit to energy resources that we have. Posterity will never forgive us. Posterity will suddenly find out about the throwaway attitudes, the throwaway lifestyles of people in the advanced countries. People all over the world have started acting against planned obsolescence. Mike Anane is fighting against it from the receiving end. He has started by collecting information. This is where I keep um, the e-waste that have asset tags or property tags. This says Amu Center Nordwest Zyland. It's from Denmark. This is from Germany. Sent here simply to be dumped. Westminster College. Apple. Apple should know better. It's a company that claims to be so green. There's a lot of Apple products that are being dumped here. I have a database that contain the asset tax, the contact um, addresses, telephone numbers of the companies that owned the electronic waste that have been dumped in Ghana. Mike Anane plans to turn this information into evidence for a court case. We need to take some action, some punitive measure. We need to sue people so they stop dumping e-waste in Ghana. is on the internet again, looking for a way to extend the life of his printer. He has discovered a Russian website which offers a free software for printers with a counter chip. The programmer has even gone to the trouble of explaining his personal motivation. This happens due to a bad construction. This is their business model. Not a good one for user and environment. So I looked and found a way to make user-friendly software to allow active users resident in pad counter. Marcos doesn't know what to expect, but downloads the software anyway. From a small village in France, John Thackera fights planned obsolescence by helping people share business and design ideas, ideas which come from all over the globe. In all poorer countries, uh, things are repaired automatically. The notion you throw a product away just because it breaks for some reason is completely unknowable and unthinkable actually to somebody in, in the South. In India there's, a, there's an actual word, jugad, to describe this tradition of being able to fix things pretty much regardless of the complexity of it. We try to find people who are actively doing projects in the world rather than just talking about things or making uh, abstract statements about how awful things are or what has to be changed. One of these people is Warner Phillips, descendant of the dynasty of light bulb manufacturers. I remember my grandfather taking me to one of the Phillips factories in Eindhoven to show me how light bulbs were mass manufactured in factories which is very, very cool. Nearly a hundred years after the creation of the light bulb cartel, Warner Phillips follows family tradition with a different approach. He produces an LED bulb which lasts 25 years. 
it's not like there's a, a green world and there is a business world. I think business and sustainability go hand in hand. It's actually the best basis to build a business on. And the only really real way to do that, I believe, is to factor in the true costs of the resources that have been used, but you also look at the energy consumption. You also look at the indirect energy consumption of transportation. Si on faisait vraiment payer aux transporteurs le coût réel du transport, sans parler du fait que le pétrole est une ressource non renouvelable et pour lequel on n'a pas vraiment de substitut, je dirais que le prix du transport devrait être multiplié par 20 ou 30. Si vous factorez tout ça dans chaque produit que vous manufacturez, alors il y aura des grands incentives pour les manufacturers et les entrepreneurs à travers le planète pour faire des produits qui restent pour toujours. Fighting against planned obsolescence can also be achieved by rethinking the engineering and production of consumer goods. A new concept called Cradle to Cradle claims that if factories worked like nature, planned obsolescence itself would become obsolete. When man über Umweltschutz redet, meint man bei uns immer sparen, verzichten, vermeiden, reduzieren, null Abfall, weniger schädlich. Wenn man sich die Natur aber im Frühling anschaut, ein Kirschbaum, kein Sparen, kein Verzichten, kein Vermeiden. Nature produces abundantly, but fallen blossoms, dead leaves and other discarded materials are not waste. They become nutrients for other organisms. A cycle. Die Natur kennt keine Abfälle, sondern sie kennt nur Nährstoffe. Braungart believes that industry can imitate this virtuous cycle of nature. He proved that this is possible when he redesigned the production process of a Swiss textile company. Wenn man zum Beispiel so einen Stoff hat dazu, ein Sofa damit bezieht oder ein Stuhl, dann ist, sind die Zuschnitte, was man abschneidet, so giftig, dass es als Sondermüll entsorgt werden muss. Braungart found that hundreds of highly toxic dyes and chemicals were routinely used at the factory. For the production of the new fabrics, Braungart and his team reduced the list to 36 substances, all biodegradable. Wir suchen jetzt alle Zutaten raus, dass man sie auch essen könnte. Das heißt, sie können die klein schneiden und in Müsli packen, wenn sie wollen. Wenn man eine Müllgesellschaft hat, ist jedes kurzlebige Produkt natürlich ein Müllproblem. Wenn es aber eine Gesellschaft ist, die Nährstoffe macht, ist jedes kurzlebige Produkt wieder eine Chance, etwas Neues zu machen. For the more radical critics of planned obsolescence, reforming production is not enough. They want us to rethink our entire economic system and our values. C'est une vraie révolution. C'est d'abord une révolution culturelle, parce que c'est un changement de paradigme, c'est un changement de mentalité. This revolution is called degrowth. Serge Latouche travels from conference to conference, explaining how to get out of the growth society altogether. La décroissance, c'est un slogan provocateur qui a pour fonction de rompre avec le discours un peu euphorisant de, de, de la croissance possible, infinie, soutenable, et donc pour marquer la nécessité de changer de logique. L'essentiel du programme, en quelque sorte, de la décroissance, tient en un mot « réduire » réduire notre empreinte écologique, réduire euh, nos gaspillages, notre surproduction, notre surconsommation. Réduisant la consommation, en réduisant la production, mais en libérant du temps libre, on peut développer d'autres formes de richesse qui ont l'avantage de, de, de ne pas s'épuiser quand on les consomme, comme l'amitié, le savoir. We increasingly rely on objects to give us a sense of self-esteem and identity. It's partly the, the consequence of the breakdown of things that used to give us identity, like membership of a community or relationship to the land or uh, all sorts of soft and social things which have been replaced by consumerism. Si le bonheur dépendait uh, du niveau de consommation, on devrait être dans la félicité absolue parce que nous consommons 26 fois plus 
que du temps de Marx, mais euh, toutes les enquêtes montrent que les gens ne sont pas 20 fois plus heureux, parce que le bonheur est toujours quelque chose de subjectif, évidemment. Critics of degrowth fear that it will destroy the modern economy and take us straight back to the Stone Age. Revenir à une société soutenable, c'est-à-dire une société dont l'empreinte écologique ne dépasse pas une planète, eh bien, ça n'est pas revenir à l'âge de pierre, c'est revenir, toutes choses égales d'ailleurs, pour un pays comme la France, aux années 60. Ça n'est pas vraiment l'âge de pierre. On peut dire que la société de décroissance réalise hein, la vision de Gandhi qui disait... Euh, le, le monde est assez grand pour satisfaire les besoins de tous, mais il sera toujours trop petit pour satisfaire l'avidité de quelques-uns. Installing the Russian freeware on his computer. The new software allows him to reset the counter chip inside his printer back to zero. The printer immediately unblocks. Unike bilder fra dyrelivet i Norge som bjørner i kamp, gaupe i boligstrøk og orrfuglenes paringsleik. Det er noe de tre naturfotografene Guttorm Ness, Torbjørn Martinsen og Bård Ness byr på fem på halv ett i natt. Programmet ble vist på NRK1 tidligere i kveld. Om fem minutter viser vi tredje del i BBCs dokumentarserie om astronomiske fenomen som skjer på grunn av de enorme kreftene fra sola. Og før det, Kenneth.